Hi and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show, coming at you from my bike cave. I've literally just unpacked the van, coming back from the Melvin Hills Classic, uh, where I saw loads of you out there, and it was absolutely awesome. So coming up on this week's show, we've got some really cool uh, bikes and tech, we've got loads of good retro stuff, and also uh, loads of good comments from last week's show. Um, let's get into the show. Okay, kicking off this week's show, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about the bike festival I've just come back from, uh, the GT Mulvans Classic. Now this is a bike festival for riders of all ages and all abilities, it really is an inclusive event and essentially it's far more in common I'd say with a festival than a bike event. Uh, There's obviously loads of bikes and stuff going on, but they've got a fun fair there for the kids with loads of free stuff, they had loads of great bands playing, I had DJs playing, I was lucky enough to be invited and I played myself there. Um, and there was just loads of great stuff going on, you didn't even need to ride a bike uh, to have a good time there. As we saw lots of people were going along to sort of cheer on their mates that were racing for the first time and you know they had like, their own entourage that were there just hanging out. So festival vibes were strong. I'm just going to throw up on screen actually a bunch of shots I think will encapsulate the weekend through my eyes on my camera. Enjoy. Okay, so let's jump into news now. And I saw loads of cool kit when I was walking around the pits there because there loads of tech stands, loads of places you could buy stuff as well, loads of stuff that was new, loads of stuff that was old. Uh, so we've got a couple of videos coming up on tech. We've got the first one coming at the weekend, uh, which is all about the cool tech that I found. So I'm not going to spoil that video for you, and nor am I going to spoil uh, the retro content because I found some really good stuff, including some 2000s downhill bikes that were just absolutely amazing. Uh, so look out for that one coming up on the channel. But firstly, I want to talk to you about Toro Cycles. Uh, look on screen now, you're going to see some images that I shot of just these beautiful bikes that nod back to what Brooklyn Machine Works were doing in the early 2000s. Now this Cornish outfit, essentially they missed the boat when they wanted to buy these bikes because um, obviously we've moved on with the times, bikes need a bit more than those early Brooklyns were doing. So they decided to essentially have a nod back to the past and replicate them uh, with modern geometry and features. So three sizes available, medium large and extra large. Medium large, medium and larges have 27 half inch wheel, whereas the extra large has the 29 inch wheel up on the front. And they had three different bikes on display, they had this yellow one, they had this pink one, and they also had Steve Gill's bike who was running in the whip off and various events over the weekend. Again, a few more shots coming up here on screen. So they use a T45 steel construction on them. Uh, the jack shaft design with the single pivot there, uh, and it's just it's just such a good looking bike. And I'll tell you what, when I was there chatting to the guys and taking some photos of the bikes, the amount of people that walked past and were turning heads was quite incredible. These bikes look really different and they just look brilliant when we saw them out on course riding. Now if you want to snap one of these up, they'll cost you about 2,600 quid for the frame. Uh, there's a 12 week wait on those uh, because you're basically buying a bespoke frame. There's loads of colours and there's shock options. I think there's Olin's and Fox and various stuff. I'm going to throw a link to their website just in the comments down below and there should be one on screen about now but I just think Toro Cycles so the bike by the way is called the EVH and it's just it's lovely it's really nice great guys as well totally doing it all for the right reasons uh, so if you're interested in something a bit different get in touch next up Curtis Trail Boss Wow, so uh, still made in Wiltshire, by the way, as they always have been. The company obviously is famous initially for making motorcycle frames and then BMX frames, and then they moved into mountain biking. And they're still making BMX frames, race light frames, and all sorts of different stuff, quirky things like single speeds, uh, you name it. And they'll make anything custom for you, um, as long as you're willing to sort of discuss with them the options that you need. Anyhow, so this particular bike belongs to Edward Smith, and I was just chatting to him, and I just thought, man, that bike is just gorgeous. So I took these photos of it. So it's a little 
slideshow photos come up on screen. Um, we were actually chatting about my old SX24 because Curtis have recently been celebrating their 50 years, just like GT, incidentally, uh, who sponsored the Mulvans Classic. Now, Curtis bikes, obviously, they're famous for their fillet brazing. And the fillet brazing, of course, say second to none, is absolutely beautiful. And as you can see on this frame, you can see some of the, the lovely detailing. Uh, so this one's designed for dirt jumping, um, purely, I mean, obviously, you can use it for whatever you want, but that's the aim of the bike. And it had a custom Olin's fork, it's shortened in travel. Oh man, I'm just looking at pictures here actually, it just looks amazing. And do you know what, I actually thought, I felt a bit jealous. Um, I'd never jealous, envious is probably a better word, uh, because everyone riding the dirt jumps have so much fun, and it's just, it feels like it's part of my life that I've just kind of left behind. I've not done jumps or anything like that for years. Maybe when Dustin gets a bit older, I'll sit and, you know, if he takes interest, I'll get another jump bike. But hey, if you want your jump bikes, you want something steel, you want something unique, you want something that's probably gonna be the last one you own, have a look at Curtis bikes, awesome stuff. And speaking of kids and riding bikes and that, Nukeproof had this one on their stand. Now we've seen the Cub Scout before, which is obviously a pint-sized version of the Scout that uh, myself, Anna, Blake, pretty much everyone on board has got a Scout hardtail. But I've got to say the Cub Scout is way cooler with that little Manitou fork. Check it out! It's unreal, isn't it? So uh, yeah, Team Yellow, the Manitou fork. And it really makes me think like the future is bright for the sport because what we saw at the Mulvans Classic, probably the, I said this before about previous years, the biggest takeaway thing is the sheer volume of kids riding. And I don't just mean kids riding, I mean kids shredding it as well. And some of them were kids that just got on, having a little wobble around like my little Dustin for the first time, to kids that were absolutely ripping. And I've got to say, some of them were making the adults look bad. So I can't, can't even fathom what it's gonna be like when those kids get a bit older and they're riding bigger, faster courses and stuff. I think the future is really good with mountain biking. Next one is Little Rider Clothing. So this is dedicated kids technical riding gear. Uh, shorts, jerseys, well they do baseball caps as well which are actually great, I've got one uh, as you can see on screen for little dust in here. Uh, but they also do riding gloves and as far as I've seen they're like the smallest riding gloves you seem to be able to get anywhere and they are proper miniature versions of what we would use uh, when we're riding. So if your kid is looking for some technical gear or more to the point you want to put your kid in some really good appropriate gear for riding in, uh, the shorts for all the parents out there, these things are amazing, they're bomb proof. Dustin's gonna be wearing his set of shorts just for knocking about in, because he wears stuff out. Uh, they are great, and it's really nice and refreshing to see some proper kids' clothing out there. Uh, way to go, always good stuff. Right, next up, GT, 50 years old, so Gary Turner bikes, which these days a lot of people are saying good times, because uh, of what GT is all about and where they're gonna be going. Um, I also hear some very exciting plans for the future for them, by the way, but, the point is they're 50 years old, so they were celebrating that fact. They had a massive stand with loads of cool stuff in there. They had loads of cool retro bikes from our friends at GT Retro Tech Shop, but also they had two stunning early bikes here that you can see on screen and two of the earliest famous colorways. So I don't know if you remember, but they had the blue and yellow, which was known as Team Screen. They also had the yellow and sort of orange, orangey red finish, which was known as Tequila Sunrise. And I love the fact that they had Wind Masters bike there, which is a brand new modern bike sprayed in that same finish. And let's check it out, it just looks amazing. But isn't it mad to think that GT bikes being 50 years old, you know, they've just kind of always been around there. And within that, Hans Ray has ridden from for 35 years. 35 years of a company that's only 50 years old. That's just, just bonkers, isn't it? Uh, they also have this amazing artwork. In fact, I've got it here because they, they gave me a print, which is by the very talented A.D. Gilbert. Now this is absolutely amazing. I'm gonna do some proper shots of this on screen, uh, but check it out. And so many people are the greats feature in there. You can see Hans Ray in there, you can see Gary Turner in there, I think Clive Gosling's in there somewhere as well. They're all in there. Super cool stuff. Um, A.D. Gilbert is an amazing illustrator. Um, we're gonna throw an Instagram handle of his on screen right now, because his stuff is just so, so cool. So I look forward to getting that one framed and getting up on the wall somewhere. More vintage stuff. Uh, this time is Hans Ray's original Trials bike. So Trials, before mountain bikers got hold of it, was 20 inch wheels. And the original point of Trials bikes was to develop skills, technical skills that they would then take on to riding motorcycle trials. Because uh, obviously mountain bikes didn't exist in those days. And this one, an LTS, weirdly named because it is linked with GT that make an LTS. Uh, the LTS has nothing to do with GT. Uh, it's a lay trial sport, I had to check that. And this one's from 1983. Hans used this in the 
European Cup on it and he won the German Championship on it. It's got the original number plates on there, it's got the original Pirelli tyres, the frame is cracked and been re-welded and it's got that drum brake on the front. But I just love the fact it's still rideable and you know, like a lot of people at the moment, Hans was really happy to sort of restore it as close as possible uh, to how it was. Obviously, it would have been minus the crack once upon a time. But man, look at the thing. It's got like a full like triple clamp twin crown fork on the front. I guess, you know, the whole thing with uh, 20 inch wheels back then, they were trying to emulate what you could do on the big motorbikes, but you clearly didn't need it because they lost those later on and went to a single crown fork, which is much lighter and easier to maneuver. Uh, but well, a legend and a bit of a legendary bike as well. Okay, now here's a cool product. Uh, I'm actually gonna put this in the tech video and show you some proper demonstrations of using it uh, by a company called Anomaly, and it's called the Switch Grade. Now, essentially, it's a head that goes on the top of your seat post. It's compatible with loads. Um, I think they said with one-up components, which you can see it on here, uh, bike yoke, um, Fox Reverb, in fact, it's on a bike yoke, what am I talking about? Um, PNW, SCG, KS, and more. So it's a retrofitable component, weighs about 170 grams, give or take, and it's got three different positions on it. Some of you might be thinking, why would you need to do that? Dropper post just goes up and down, why do you need it to do more? Well, if you're the sort of rider that's doing sort of plummet and winch style riding, you're literally uh, trying to get up a fire road or something as smooth and quick as possible that ends up being very steep up to the top of the mountain in order to like absolutely bomb it back down again. Tipping the nose of your saddle down effectively makes your saddle very slightly higher. It makes it a lot more comfortable, puts you in a better riding position, effectively steepens your seat angle on the bike, which is why you do see some riders with very high seats running them nose down. But of course, when you're on flat terrain and when you're descending, it feels horrible. You've got no support or purchase or anything. So it's great for that. The mid setting is flat or as close to flat as you like to set it for your normal riding. And that's where you could leave it for a lot of stuff. And then the nose up is when you slam it down because you see a lot of downhill riders, dirt jumpers, other people like to run the nose slightly up on the saddles. And if you've never tried it, try it. It's really quite cool because it makes it very easy to pinch between your legs uh, for stability and to be able to lean on it because it's just that little bit higher up than it would be otherwise. Uh, but it's a very cool product. It's CNC machine from Aerospace Grade 7075T6 and 6061T6 aluminium. Uh, but it's just a super cool product and it's definitely niche but it has got a place I think. And last up, uh, the other cool thing I saw was from Brink Engineering. So it seems every man and his dog out there has got some kind of van to store their bike in, whether they've converted to a camper or not. Now these these guys make these trays that slide out the back of your bike, um, out the back of your bike, uh, with your bike on, and they slide out the back of the van. So they're available in different sizes to suit different amounts of weight. Um, size bikes and stuff like that and they're even strong enough to put on things like moto bikes as in moto trials bikes they are seriously well made so they're made from aluminium but don't think that, that makes them light and bendy or anything these things are stiff and really really quite sturdy so they say on oh, just the one that i'm showing you here uh, can fit up to four bikes depending on your setup they've got drain holes on them so if they're wet you know stuff can drain out of them they can either bolt to the floor of your van or you can purchase with an adapter plate so it's it will mount to an L track, which makes it removable, uh, which is really cool. Fork mounts are sold separately, and there's no pre-drilled -hole, uh, pre holes in the tray, so you put your own mounts on that work for your vehicle. Now, these things are really quite cool. Their website, as I checked it this morning, actually is down. Uh, I think they're sort of um, improving things on there, but their Instagram page is working. These products, I'll tell you, when I saw them in the flesh, they are absolutely beautifully made. Now, I've seen many friends who've got converted campers that have got similar sort of tray style systems, and this by far is the stiffest and like the world, the world best made speak English boy what am I doing it's really really well made and manufactured so if you're looking for something that's really heavy duty to you know particularly if you've got e-bikes and things these would be absolutely brilliant for the back of your van very very cool stuff yeah, there we go that was news from the Melvins Okay, we've got time for some comments from last week's show where I was using and abusing various different things to open bottles with. Uh, and there's some pretty good comments in here. Stuart Patterson says, I believe you can use SPD cleats to open bottles. Yep, you certainly can. You can also use the pedals because they just happen to have the little jaw and not just SPD pedals, any generic clipless style pedal, whether it's Crank Brothers or a HT or whatever, you can use them to open bottles as well. Um, Xander Lex says, if you didn't build the bike already, include a bottle opener in it. Yeah, it's probably well, it's going to have one on there somewhere, isn't it? Either way. Uh, Dunks Loft says, ah, and there's the Kevin Talbot reference when talking about dream builds. Yep, 
like I say, the stuff he's done is really cool. I'm not mega into radio control cars, but I used to be when I was a kid. I've got a couple of Optima Pros somewhere in bits, uh, speed controllers and stuff would be dead by now. And I've got a couple of old Kyosho cars. I've got like an original Super Bomber, a Big Brute, which I had when I was a bit younger before I got onto the Optimas. Um, but yeah, I'm going to get back into radio control, radio control cars at some point. I've already got that tiny little grave digger up there that I've got for Dustin. Well, well, for me and Dustin to laugh at the moment, let's be clear about that. But um, RC cars are rad and Kev Tolbert is a cool dude. Uh, next up from Andre, who says, bike of thesis problem. Do you change all the components? Sorry, if you change all the components on a bike, is it still the same bike? If not, which is the limit that marks the transition into another bike? Um, I guess the frame. Really, isn't it? And it kind of reminds me of Trigger's broom in Only Falls and Horses. If anyone's seen that, uh, you know, as soon as you change the frame out, it's obviously another bike. And Trigger's broom's had a new head and a new shaft many, many times. And uh, yeah, it's still the same broom somehow. Uh, Rupert went, hey Rupert, good to see you at the event. Uh, never spotted the pad space of bottle owners. I thought SRAM's best invention was uh, cage lock. How wrong I was. Yeah, hiding in plain sight the whole time. Yeah, very cool. Uh, Andy Gilbert says, if you've got a good set of teeth, they're a bottle opener. Winds up anyone in the NHS, dentists, etc. Um, I used to do that all the time, and then I really hurt my tooth one day doing it, and I haven't done it since. And then uh, Mr. Steve Gregory says, is Doddy pronouncing the silent K in Knipex? Um, well, a few people had a jib at me about this. I used to say Nipex, speaking English language, you do a silent K like you do a knife and stuff, don't you? Um, however, um, someone from Knipex brought me up on it and um, it was just like we actually pronounce the K in Knipex and also there's a little link to a video um, if we're able to play it on screen it's going to be playing now it is from Knipex themselves um, if not there's going to be a link to it in the comments underneath about the pronunciation of it so hey ho well live and learn it yeah okay quiz time GT had two iconic paint jobs on their classic bikes what were they called Tora Cycles make incredible looking bikes using a high pivot and a jack shaft style system to drive them. But what bikes were they inspired by? And last question, what is a height right? Okay, now we've got time for rewind, um, especially because I've just come back from Mulvans. I was one of the judges on the Muck Off Show and Shine, uh, which is a retro bike show where people and collectors bring their bikes along uh, to show them off and for everyone to appreciate them. And there's also a bit of a judge competition on there uh, where three particular bikes will win, uh, will win prizes, but a top 10 will be awarded rosettes, uh, which is a really cool thing. Now you've got to bear in mind, there are so many different bikes and so many different eras that are brought along. And the judges, there's loads of us uh, on board there, each with different specialities, some like myself being a bit more generic, others being very specialist and focused. Uh, some of the retro bike crew are in there and they really know their biscuits. Uh, but it was really cool to hang out and just admire all the bikes. And there was three particular bikes that obviously got through on one, but I just want to have a little nod to some of the ones that really did it for me. Uh, the first one was the Martin Ashton Cannondale Beast of the East, uh, the replica. Oh my God. Right, so that bike, as soon as I saw that, it just took me back to my childhood. Uh, the whole build, as far as I could see on it, was just absolutely as Martin used to ride it. I'm going to show this one to Martin actually tomorrow. I'm going to be filming a dirt shed with him and talking a bit about some of the old stuff like this. Um, but that bike was absolutely stunning um, and it really gave me a massive dose of nostalgia which really that's kind of what the point of the Retro Show and Shine is, is to take you back and remind you, know, remind you of some cool stuff that happened once upon a time. Uh, but beautiful bike by the way that one um, and I actually voted that one should have been in the top three but hey it was a, a big board of us talking about stuff uh, and also actually the Pashley that was next door to it um, equally for the same reasons but not quite as influential for me no doubt Ed Tung when he was riding those bikes was just unbelievable on them like the stuff he could do but but Martin was a real deal for me um, and I still feel the same you know I feel like it's a pleasure to work with a man uh, the Fisher RS1 had to be in there for me um, that bike design and although this one didn't have a mag 20 or 21 on it i forget what the original did it did have the lower leader fork and it's got the lower back end on that bike man it was like far ahead of its time in those days and this one was great i think some people on the board you know were looking at bikes they wanted to look at the carpet queen style bikes that are just beautiful and they're done up to sort of look nice at home and i completely get that um, i really want to do one of those myself but I quite like the fact that this one looked a bit battered. It'd been ridden, it'd been sort of used for its job and it was there just proudly saying, hey, you know what, I've done this before. So that was cool. And um, the funk, oh, 
that paint job. I've not seen one of that paint job, but I've only ever seen them before in like sort of the classic pink or the more single bold colours. But this one, it was almost a bit more of a Klein style paint job on it, but oh my God. Um, although I did see that one of the other judges reminded me, um, Hatch actually said, hey, look, the brakes are the wrong way around. And I was thinking, oh, what do you mean? Like left and the right, right and the left. But the actual uh, brake cantilevers, apparently the longer ones, uh, those on, on the ratios are supposed to be on the front, the short ones on the back. I didn't know that. I've got a set and I should know that. But um, tell you what, the level of some of these judges, what they could comment on is unreal. Uh, the Kona Explosive, whoa, just that bike. Absolutely beautiful condition. Would have been lovely to see the Kona tires on there as well, but I guess that's near impossible to get all of those. Um, and that mint Pace RC100 that was just like a barn find or wherever it came from, uh, completely new, essentially. Uh, that is just one of my all time favorite bikes. Beautiful. But let's quickly talk about the top three that got through because they each have their own important stories. So in third place was the Cannondale Ambulance Bike. Now I know a lot of people at the festival look at it thinking, why is that even in the top 10, let alone the top three? It's just a Cannondale with a head shock on it and it's been battered around on the streets of London with a param paramedic riding it. But I think that's the exact point of it. So uh, this was the idea of Tom Lynch, who's himself a legendary BMX racer, and he actually was exhibiting bikes in the BMX show and shine as well. Uh, but there's two of these bikes that exist, Tom's paramedic, and he had the idea for London Transport to try and lower the sort of um, lowering the response times in London when it was a really severe thing with traffic's being a problem for getting people around, ultimately saving people's lives. And he, he pitched saying, hey, look, I've got a great idea. Let's get a bike built up and do this. So he got the bike from Cannondale and it's actually Clive of Cannondale that got him the bike. There's two of them that exist. The other one, because it's so important, is actually in the Science Museum in London um, as a permanent thing on display there with its uh, defibrillator and all the sort of kit, the spec on there. Now the bike was launched in 1998, but this particular one launched the ambulance service in 2000 uh, with a specific job of lowering response times. Um, and when first launched, each one of these bikes saved over 250 hours of frontline ambulance time. Um, and to me and all the other judges, when we found out all these stats, it's, it's amazing what that's done uh, for the NHS and helping support people. So we just thought having the humble mountain bike doing the job of an ambulance uh, is something that should be recognized. And sorry to all the people that sort of disagreed with that, but we felt it was very valid and there's plenty of room for other bikes in the future. And we are going to be revising the way we do the judging and trying to bring some more fun elements into it as well. But that bike, I thought it was a really important one. So very cool stuff to see. Um, second place, Cannondale SM700, this one, the pink one, for 1986. I took loads of shots of this bike. This was just me all over. Absolutely loved this thing. Uh, but turns out literally all the other judges agreed on this one. Um, so this one's a mint build, right? So almost like new old stock, like the whole thing. Uh, so one of the earliest mullet style bikes, 24 inch wheel on the back, 26 on front. Um, unique paint job on there, roller cam brakes, which are just, they felt so good. And they had a height right on the bike um, and it worked perfectly. So I've seen loads of height rights and I've got one somewhere stashed here, but I've never felt one in use on a bike that actually works really well. You could get away using it. Like I'm quite shocked. So in case you're wondering what height right is, it's essentially an early dropper post. So you'd, um, it would stop your seat, sorry, it would stop your saddle going side to side, uh, but it would allow it to go up and down to a predetermined amount. You literally under your quick release, sit down, lock it again, it stays down. When you want it to come up, you stand up and unlock your quick release. Bit of a faff, but much quicker than using your regular quick release. Mega cool stuff. Um, and in first place, pan, um, <laughs> I was that Panandale then, the Pace RC100T trials bike for 1989. Now this I'd never seen before and actually I thought, oh, someone's painted a Pace bike yellow and turned into a trials bike, but actually this is a legit one-off bike. So it was built by Duncan from Pace with some tubes that had been damaged, they'd essentially fallen off a stack of tubes. So he cut them down, those damaged ones, was like, that's enough to make myself a trials bike. So did a side project, built myself a trials bike, never got to ride it, it got stolen. Um, and eight or nine years ago, it surfaced on a German eBay site and a lot of the collectors were like, nah, it's not legit. Like someone's just bodged this together. It's not like one of the real ones. Uh, Cause they obviously made trials bikes much later down the line. Chris Ackwick used to ride them at one point but it's been validated, it is the real deal. Um, and the fork on there is the first fork that Pace made as well, which is a very cool story because ultimately that's what made them made forks. Got grease ports on there, 24 inch wheels with uh, Comp 3 tires on there, which was really cool to see. And I know there were some BMX guys looking at those tires thinking, they look pretty good, I'd like to buy them for my, my rebuild. Uh, and even the the, uh, the bash guard on it was completely original, uh, but apparently it was sort of tainted slightly yellow, uh, so you had to like file it right back to bring back the original uh, sort of white, sort of Delrin sort of color to it. 
Um, very, very cool stuff to see. And there we go, that was the uh, Mulvans Retro Show and Shine. Uh, three very cool, very different style bikes, and I think a lot of people are like, hold on a second, you know, we want to see some downhill bikes, we want to see this, we want to see that. And I've got the idea really of having um, different categories, I think, for next year. Um, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll have to have a proper think about this, but um, more on that when all the judges have sort of conferred afterwards. Okay, so let's jump into quiz answers, and then that will be the wrap up of this week's show. So, GT had two iconic paint jobs on their classic bikes, what were they called? Uh, the blue and yellow was known as Team Scream, and the red or the orange and the yellow um, was known as Tequila Sunrise, which to me, I, I can't think of a cooler looking paint job. I think that is so, so cool. Um, next up, Tora Cycles make incredible looking bikes with a high single pivot and a jack shaft system to drive them. What bikes were they inspired by? Yeah, Brooklyn Machine Works. BMW, um, not the uh, Bavarian mo Motorworks you're thinking of, uh, Brooklyn Machine Works, which still have got to be one of the coolest companies to dabble in bikes, I reckon. Uh, I'd love to know what you think. If you've heard of them or if you've got one, please show it to us. I would love to see a BMW again. And what is a height right? And if you're listening right, you'd have found out it's the original dropper post. Long before we had telescopic posts, we had uh, this simple invention that you can see in this photo. And uh, you might be wondering what it even is, but it keeps your saddle in line, you undo a quick release, sit on it, um, and when you undo your quick release for it to go back up again, the sprung operation pulls your saddle back up. And there we go. Uh, that is the end of this week's show. I've still got loads of unpacking to do. Uh, in fact, just one last thing before we go. I've got a bike here, I'm gonna wheel it outside and take some shots of it in a minute. Now, this was actually, I had a little moment. Um, went to see the guys over at Retro Bike, who, who, they're all super cool. I class them all as my friends now. And they knew that my first mountain bike was a Muddy Fox Courier Mega. I had it at the Mulvans in 1991, uh, when I was there for the first time riding. And um, one of the guys at Retro Bike found one at a car boot sale, essentially, um, for a tenner, and he bought it for me. Um, so I took it home with me, and it's it's amazing. It felt really weird to see it again. It, it took me straight back to my riding as a kid, and by no means was it a particularly good bike. It was just an um, entry-level to mid-range bike. Uh, I'm going to do it up from memory as much as I could to get it back to how I used to have it. So do not need too much stuff, because I was only a kid, you used to upgrade bits and pieces on there. Um, and I'm going to show it off to you in a few days, but here's a couple of shots of it as it is now. Um, and I'm absolutely stoked of it. So thank you so much to all the retro community, because you're all amazing, as are every one of you that watch this show every week. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you've not already done so. And give us a bit of love on the shop. We've got loads of cool gear. There's always new stuff dropping. Uh, so just check it out from time to time. You'd be surprised how good some of the stuff is these days on there. Um, thanks for watching. See you on next week's show. Ta-ra.